We are delighted to have you here tonight. It is a, really a gift to just see your witness of interest in education and how the Holy Spirit is moving, bringing about change and transformation in our culture through education. And, and you are the vehicle. You are the, the vessel that the Holy Spirit is using to bring that about. So we're grateful for this, this gathering tonight. I want to thank uh, Larry Neenhaus, especially for his leadership and bring this about. And we're delighted to have Dr. Dale Elquist with us tonight. I'm going to introduce him shortly. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and uh, then I'll have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Elquist. Let us pray together in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, with joy and thanksgiving, we come before you tonight asking for your blessing on this gathering. You who are the faithful one, the one who is the strength of our hearts, who leads us in your wisdom and light as we seek to guide our children into your presence. We ask your blessing on Dr. Elquist tonight, and especially a blessing on the family of St. Thomas and all the families that are represented here before you. Move as parents, as educators, as adults committed to the future of our nation, of our culture, of our children, as we seek your light in guiding our children. Bless this night with your peace, your joy, and your love as we pray together to Our Lady. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, Dr. Dale Elquist, uh, we have him here tonight in Ann Arbor, but he has been around the world in revealing, proclaiming the wisdom of G.K. Chesterton. He's spoken at major universities throughout the United States and Europe, including the Vatican Forum in Rome, the House of Lords. He's a, he's a senior fellow of the Chesterton Library at Oxford University. And sure enough, G.K. Chesterton obviously had an amazing impact on his life. Uh, G.K. Chesterton is the apostle of common sense, and Dale Elquist is the apostle of the apostle of common sense. And, <laughs> That happened actually when he was reading The Everlasting Man uh, on his honeymoon and he was impacted by the reading of G.K. Chesterton's uh, vision, uh, revealed vision, united with the revelation of our Catholic faith in that book. And he began then researching the history of, Catholic, of Christianity with the Church Fathers and of course you know where that's going to lead. And sure enough, in 1997, he converted to the Catholic faith. So he has continued his work in being able to proclaim the wisdom, the genius of G.K. Chesterton. And he has written several books. You've seen them there. Uh, very well known. You know, G.K. Chesterton, The Apostle of Common Sense. Common Sense 101, Lessons of G.K. Chesterton. And The Complete Thinker, among several others that we have available here tonight. You may have seen him on EWTN in uh, the series, uh, The Apostle of Common Sense, a wonderful program, extremely formative of, of Catholic thought, and cleverly done as well. And he founded, in 1996, the American Chesterton Society, flagship publication of that uh, institution is the Gilbert, Gilbert, which you are able to sign up for there at the table as well. I'm most excited to be able to share his background in education. He is a co-founder of a classical school. Chesterton Academy in Minneapolis was founded in 2012, eight, and high school. So we're very excited to be able to have him speak to us on the vision of G.K. Chesterton, the prophetic vision of G.K. Chesterton, and how classical Catholic education is a ferment of transformation in our society. Let's welcome Dr. Elkin. Well, it's 
great to be here. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. I'm really blessed. Uh, the whole the whole week I've been here in across southern and central Michigan has just been delightful, and I'm really grateful to uh, Father Peter Clark, who's done so much work to set all this up. And so we've been going from peak to peak. But listen, well, we're gonna. I'll give you just a quick introduction to our man G.K. Chesterton. And then we're going to talk about what you came here to hear about tonight, which is classical education. And it's really a privilege to be able to talk about that, because this is how we're going to fix what's broken in this society. We're going to do it from the ground up. There are no top-down solutions. So we have to start by just admitting that, and then we have to roll up our sleeves and get to work. So uh, you know, the Catholic Church, one of the great things I like about it um, is that there's so much suffering in it. <laughs> and uh, I certainly intend to make you suffer tonight, <laughs> but it's going to end happily because you're going to be spending money over there at my table <laughs> buying my books. So that's the, the, after that you can stop suffering. In 1910, G.K. Chesterton wrote a book called What's Wrong with the World, 1910. And he identified four things that are wrong with the world. Big government, big business, feminism, and public education. 1910. I drink this, will my microphone go into this or not? <laughs> Why are those the four things that are wrong with the world? Because they all undermine the family. Big business undermines the family because it not only pulls the father out of the home, it pulls the mother out of the home. Especially thanks to the corollary thing that's wrong with the world, feminism. Big government comes in and replaces the function of the family by providing all the services that used to be provided naturally by the family. Especially education, which is one of the other things that's wrong with the world. G.K. Chester says that when the state took over education, the state was given more power than it's ever had in all of human history. Because we are giving our children to the state at the most formative period in their lives and we're letting the state educate them. And what we've done, of course, is we've driven a wedge between parent and child by putting the state in charge of education. Uh, and of course, he said the feminists have been the dupes in all this because by demanding equal rights with men, what they were demanding, of course, were the jobs that men had. And Chesterton says women have always been able to do all the things that men have done, except that women can always do that one thing that men have never been able to do, which is be a mother. The one unique thing that men cannot do. And uh, feminism has just generally been an attack on motherhood. That's why it's the feminists who are always upholding abortion rights. But the irony is that by putting themselves into the workplace in competition with men, they basically lost the independence and freedom that they had as mothers because the home is the place of freedom and the place of influence and the place where the society is actually formed. Chesterton has the line, he says, 10,000 women march through the streets saying, we will not be dictated to. And they went off and became stenographers. <laughs> but Chesterton says that without the family, we're helpless before the state. It's the family that has to be the primary institution and the primary unit of a society. And if the family is weakened, the whole society is weakened, the whole culture is weakened. 
And if you have other forces controlling the formation of our children, that is what's going to weaken the entire culture. Uh, G.K. Chesterton said we are heading towards a new Dark Ages. And if any of you remember the Dark Ages, there's a few of you who are old enough. <laughs> what happened? It was, it was the decline of paganism to the barbarians. See, paganism was actually a civilized culture. But barbarism was the destruction of civilization. The only thing that saved civilization was this one institution called the Catholic Church. It was the monasteries that preserved learning and preserved culture, and preserved agriculture, preserved everything that was civilization, and carried it through the Dark Ages until it started to rebuild civilization, which was the Middle Ages, and really the great high point of civilization, the High Middle Ages, that built the great cathedrals of Europe, the oldest buildings in the world that are still being used for their original purpose. But uh, in the Dark Ages, uh, that the role that was played by the monasteries in preserving civilization, Chesterton, were, well, Chesterton says, in the new Dark Ages, we really don't have the monasteries anymore. We have a few, but we don't have, we don't have the extent of the monastic system that saved civilization the first time the Dark Ages came around. And Chester says, it's going to have to be the family that preserves learning and preserves culture and, and passes art and beauty and the faith from one generation to the, to the next. The family's going to have to play the role that the monasteries played in the, the first time the Dark Ages came around. Chesterton says, you know, man has always lost his way. The problem is that now man has lost his address. Uh, and that's, that's why we, we really have a, a world that is continuing to wander in the dark and just, just wander deeper into the darkness. And so we have a, a particular call as Catholic families to preserve the culture, to preserve the great things of the past and give them to the next generation. To give them philosophy and music and literature and art and all of the great accomplishments that have, that really are unique to our civilization that are being whittled away in all of our institutions that are supposed to be preserving those things. We have to do the work to preserve them. That's what we're called to do. It's certainly not being done in our public schools. Chesterton says the whole problem, and I never did give that, I said I was going to give an introduction to Chesterton, didn't I? I never did. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> We, we can always introduce Chesterton later. I'm on a roll here. Does anybody remember what I was saying? <laughs> he says, um, the problem with education today is that, uh, you know, traditionally what education has always done is, is simply pass the truth from one generation to the next. That's what its role is. It takes what's been learned here and teaches the next generation the same thing, and it's passed on. And that's been the role of education. And it actually has been fairly successful for several centuries. Uh, several centuries. But there's, in the last century or so, we've started to see a major failure in the role of the schools, and it somehow correlates to the time the government took over the schools. And, uh, and we've stopped teaching traditional truths. We've stopped teaching truth altogether. And instead, we're teaching the latest fads and the latest fashions and the latest trends and the latest ideas and the newest. 
And Chesterton says, the problem is that our children are exposed to educational th theories that are younger than they are. And he said that 200 years ago. Has it gotten better? Well, of course it has. He also says the problem is with our modern education is that we have separated everything from everything else. So we teach this subject here and this subject there and that subject over there by all these different specialists who have no communication or correlation with each other and there's no cohesive way of teaching a truth, a truth that involves philosophy and uh, theology and literature and art and beauty and goodness. None of those things are cohesive anymore. Everything's separated from everything else. Chester says the world has become one wild divorce court. And so we only, we just teach fragments of the truth. And children learn fragments of the truth and they can't put it together and they start thinking in fragments. And if you listen to them talk, they talk in fragments. They don't, we don't hear complete <laughs> G.K. Chesterton says, the one thing that is never taught in any of our public schools is this, that there is a whole truth of things, and that in knowing it and speaking it, we are happy. Now, Frank Sheep once said, if you want your audience to remember anything, we have to say it three times. Because when you say it the first time, they'll go, oh, that's interesting. Uh. But if you say it the second time, they'll go, well, now I've heard this somewhere before. <laughs> and then when you say it the third time, they'll go, you know, this guy's smart. He thinks the same way I do. <laughs> So I'm going to say it again. The one thing that is never taught in any of our public schools is this, that there is a whole truth of things, and that in knowing it and speaking it, we are happy. I've heard that somewhere before. The one thing that is never taught in any of our public schools is this, that there is a whole truth of things and that in knowing it and speaking it, we are happy. That's beautiful and that's rich and that's what we have to achieve, is teach the whole truth and teach our children how to then express the whole truth and they will be happy. Because if you've noticed anything about the modern world, people are depressed. There is such a pervasive sadness among not only our young people but everybody else because they are exposed to just fragments of the truth and they can't put anything together. In 1937, the president of the University of Chicago, Robert Hutchins, addressed the National Catholic Education Association and he said the Catholic Church possessed the longest intellectual tradition of any institution in the world. And yet Catholic education in the United States had imitated the worst features of secular education. 1937. This was an outsider. This was an outsider saying, to the Catholic educators, you have the longest tradition, the longest intellectual tradition of any institution in the world, and yet you are just simply imitating the secular schools. And that's what's happened since. People sometimes ask me, what would Chesterton have thought of the Common Core? <laughs> and you have to understand, I don't put words in Chesterton's mouth. He puts words in my mouth. That's how it works, okay? So I don't say what he would have said. I can say what he did say. 
And I can say exactly what he did say about the Common Core. But if I were to say what he would say, <laughs> I would say he would say that it's not common and it's not the core, okay? But what he did say in a talk in 1927 called Culture and the Coming Peril, he said, to put it shortly, the evil that I'm trying to warn you about is not excessive democracy, it's not excessive ugliness, it's not excessive anarchy, it is this, it is standardization by a low standard. So, how do we fix education? We don't do it by a new theory and a new fad and a new idea. We go back and we see what worked for a really long time until we stopped using it. And then education started failing when we stopped using what did work once. And that's what classical education is. It means we take the great accomplishments, the great learning, the great ideas of our civilization and we teach those things to our young people. We, we start right, we start with philosophy, we start with literature, and you know what? It helps to use the same language that some of this stuff was written in. We teach Latin. We teach a classical language along with it. Because when you learn Latin, you start thinking in a more logical manner. Your math scores increase if you learn Latin. Because there is a cohesiveness to education. And what you learn over here is supposed to be attached to what you learn over here. And there's a connection between Latin and math and it goes through philosophy. Because if you learn good logic, you can do math well. Because both math and philosophy are about logic and reason and clear thinking. And that's why you teach philosophy to young people. And at Chester Academy, when we teach philosophy, especially to boys, they just light up because they discover for the first time that their thoughts can be ordered. And they just love it. They just light up with philosophy. Whereas our schools have stopped teaching philosophy, and the first time a kid takes a philosophy course is in college, and he'll probably start with existentialism. And he thinks that's philosophy. He starts with the things that's been the disintegration of philosophy. So you start by teaching Plato and Socrates. You start by teaching Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey. You start with that in ninth grade. And you start laying a foundation. And you start with ancient history to see how we got to where we are. And you a supplement with the Old, Te Old Testament, because that's also ancient history, but it's also the introduction to God. Because God has to inform everything that you're teaching. And you really, you can teach, there can, there can be classical education without teaching God, except there can't be. <laughs> because when you leave God out of it, you actually end up leaving everything out of it. Chesterton says whether you're talking about pigs or binomial theory, you're actually talking about God. And you have to make it all relevant to an ultimate meaning. Because kids figure out right away, they figure it out right away that, well, what's the purpose of learning this? I don't see any purpose at all. And they know when they're learning something, studying something, it doesn't, doesn't have any meaning to it. But if you start giving the meaning to it and start pointing to something ultimate, they start putting it together. And that starts leading them and driving them. There is a connection between all these things we teach. We, sh we, we weave them together. Uh, we, st we study the classics. Well, Chester says, if we really want to expand education, we have to include the older and the wiser things. 
If we're going to expand education, we have to expand it to include the older and the wiser things. What is it that makes a classic a classic? Chesterton says, we study the Iliad because all of life is a battle. We study the Odyssey because all of life is a journey. We study the book of Job because all of life is a riddle. The eternal questions are asked and wrestled with in the ancient classics. And they're just as relevant today. And kids like the fact that they come in stories. They love the stories. Because that's the best way to tell any truth. <laughs> Chesterton says, I doubt whether any truth can be told except in a parable. There was someone else who figured that out, too. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? They were, they always talked in parables. But it, it'll come to me. It'll come to me. We study we study history and we study literature. Why do we study history? Because history is the story of salvation. That's why we study history. We study history because we see what happened before Christ, and we study what happened after Christ, and how the whole world was longing for God to step into history. And how as soon as he did, history changes. The whole hinge of history is when Jesus steps onto the stage. And so you study history because everything is connected to the salvation story. But you study literature because literature is a retelling of the salvation story. It's, it's our way of restating the story. Because as Chesterton says, every romance has three characters in it. It has St. George, it has the dragon, and it has the princess. Every story has those three characters. The dragon is the thing to be fought, and the princess is the thing to be loved, and St. George is the thing that fights and loves. And all of literature is about fighting and loving. And if you Fight without loving? Well, that's simply a dangerous form of horseplay, says, says Chesterton. But if you love without fighting, that's simply lust. If you're not willing to lay yourself down and sacrifice yourself for your love, it is simply lust. There's no sacrifice involved. There's a connection between history and literature, between philosophy and math, and between science and art. Why is it that as soon as a kid starts showing any interest in science, we stop teaching him art? Why is it that when a kid starts studying art, we stop teaching him science? Oh, let him follow his interest. Now, when they're young, they don't even know what they're interested in. We'll tell them what they're interested in. When they're older, they can decide. They can make all the decisions they want. They want to specialize. When they're young, you give them the balance of truth and the balance of discipline. And they learn, they learn how to be creative, but they also learn how to be logical. And they have to develop their scientific part of the brain and their artistic part of the brain. But you know what? There's a connection between art and science that everyone forgets. Because they're both about observation, they're both about understanding proportion and balance and design. And if we start looking at the created world like a work of art, we're going to see it even better. That this is God's handiwork we're studying. This is God's artistic masterpiece that we're looking at when we study biology. Biology is a branch of theology because we're looking at the mind of God when we look at his creation. And when we study art, we are, we are doing the God-like thing because God made us creators and made us in his own image so we get to create things. And that's what we do when we make art. And our creation reflects God's creation. And the more that we put those things together, the more we understand both things. You only get one chance to educate your children. 
And there's nothing more important than the souls of your children. And you have to give them the truth. And everything you teach them has to be connected to that truth. The incarnation has to inform every other thing you teach. It all has to be centered on the fact that God became flesh. That we are sinful and have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. And that's the truth that informs literature and philosophy and science and language because the word became flesh. That's what a classical education is about. The whole point, says Chesterton, of education is to give people an eternal set of standards with which they can judge fugitive standards. Give your kids an eternal set of standards.